Yep, ready to go. Hello. Welcome to the 42nd annual WEB Dubai's uh, Distinguished Lecture. My name is Gloria Chuku, Professor and Chair of African Studies Department. It is nice to see everyone this evening, albeit remotely. I want to thank the Dresser Center for Humanities and the Social Science Forum for co-sponsoring this lecture. I have two important announcements to make for Africana Studies majors and minors. For Africana Studies majors and minors, uh, please do remember that November 16th is the deadline for the submission of the L.A. Chupu Njaka Scholarship and Creative Research Award applications. <clears throat> visit our department website for more information. We are also now recruiting for the International Model African Union to take place um, late February 2021. Uh, please, if you are interested, it is open to UMBC students. If you are interested, uh, send me an email at chuku, C-H-U-K-U, at umbc.edu. <clears throat> what a year. Certainly, it is an understatement to say that so much about our world has changed this year, caused especially by rampaging effects of COVID-19, as well as um, increased police and white supremacist violence against Black Americans nationwide multiracial and multi-generational protests for racial equality and social justice. The 2020 elections, massive voter out turnout <clears throat> in spite of increased efforts aimed at voter suppression. The election of the first woman to the vice presidency of the United States, Kamala Harris, who has shattered many glass ceilings for the first, for being the first black woman and South Asia vice president elect, the symbolism of her election to young women and girls and to immigrant families in the country cannot be underestimated. I urge every one of us to continue to dream big and to pursue our dreams without fear. For this evening lecture, real time captioning will be provided. To access it, please locate the three dots at the bottom right side of the screen and click on them. Then click on multimedia viewer to open panel that displays the captioning. After the lecture, we will have a brief Q&A. To ask a question, please utilize the Q&A panel on the right-hand side. That can be accessed through the, through the, uh, the three dots as well. Our speaker this evening is Dr. Kanyaso uh, K. Wise Whitehead. Associate Professor of Communication and African American Studies at Loyola University, Maryland, and the award-winning radio host today with Dr. K on WEAA 88.9 FM. Dr. Whitehead is the founding director of the Kersen Institute for Race, Peace, and Social Justice. She is the author of four books, including Note from a Colored Girl, The Civil War Pocket Diaries of Emily Frances Davis, which won both the Darling Clark Hine Book Award and the Letitia Woods Brown Book Award. The book was based on her dissertation. This year, Dr. Whitehead was uh, selected by the Daily Record as one of Maryland's top 100 women. And in 2019, she received the Collegium Dictionary Award 
from the College of Holy Cross. And of course, the Exceptional Marriage in Media Award from the National Women's Political Caucus for her work editing and compiling a special issue of the Meridian's Feminism, Race, Transnationalism Journal. Dr. Whitehead was also selected by the Baltimore Sun as one of Baltimore's 25 women to watch in 2019. And by Essence Magazine, which included her on the 2019 Walk 100 list of Black women advocating for change. She has given over 500 keynotes nationwide. It is also important to note that Dr. A. Whitehead is one of us, having received her PhD from UMBC in 2009 in the LLC Language, Literature, and Culture Program. It is therefore with great delight that I present to you Dr. Whitehead. Thank you so much. I am delighted to be here. I'm deeply honored it doesn't even begin to capture how I'm feeling. I am back home to a place where I begin to craft my vision of who I want to be in the world at this moment. Courtney, would you be kind enough to mute everyone? There is a little bit of some notes there. Thank you. So when I think about my work at UMBC, my journey to where I am this moment started on that campus. I remember the first time that I walked on the campus back in 2016. Um, I had my two sons with me. Uh, they were five and six years old. I said 2016, it was 2006. I'm a lot older than I'd like to admit at this moment. Uh, we were walking around campus and I was trying to convince myself that I belonged in a PhD program. I was a full-time teacher uh, with 15 preps per week. And I remember that day so vividly, not just because I got lost and my sons were dragging their toys and snacks and books with them to sit through my night classes, but because this was the first time that I met Dr. Freeman Rabowski. Uh, he walked up to us on campus and welcomed us to UMBC. And then he spoke to my sons. He looked them in the eyes and in my opinion, he spoke genius into them. He told them about a story about how when he was a young boy, he wrote his name, Dr. Rabowski, on a piece of paper and taped it to his mirror and greeted himself like that every morning. He didn't stop doing that until he got his PhD and someone else called him Dr. Rabowski. The next morning when I woke up, my five and six year old sons were running around and calling themselves Dr. Whitehead, Dr. Whitehead, and they have continued to do that through the years. Now for them, that was a dream at that age. Uh, it was a long-term goal. But when he said that, it started something in me. And when I sat in my first class that night, I wrote in my journal, good morning, Dr. Whitehead, you belong right where you are at this moment because you are only one day away from tomorrow. And whenever I felt that I could not go on, I couldn't write another paper, couldn't read another book, couldn't sit in another class and stay awake, I would go back to that note and I would say, good morning, Dr. Whitehead, you belong right where you are at this moment because you are only one day away from tomorrow. And throughout the years, whenever I have felt challenged, I have to remind myself one day away from tomorrow, whatever that tomorrow is that you imagine you're one day away. So I feel that I have come full circle tonight, coming back virtually to give this prestigious lecture. Uh, only days after historic election, during a very historic time. And I want to kind of lay that out tonight. I consider myself to be a storyteller. And so in telling some stories of how I am framing this very historical moment, it was at 189 years ago today that freedom fighter Nat Turner was hanged in Jerusalem, Virginia. 
At that time, the U.S. Census noted that the population stood at about 12.9 million people with 2 million enslaved men, women, and children, and 319,000 free Black people. Now, most of them lived in the South, but about 150,000 free Black people lived in the North in very thriving and rich communities. It was 150 years ago that the ratification of the 15th Amendment, which guaranteed the right to vote for Black men, was passed. Now, that was only five years after slavery ended and right after the KKK had begun. 148 years ago, all in this historic year, race leader and suffragist Charlotte Rollin, and I read this from uh, Dr. Brittany Cooper, joked that she should run for vice president of the United States. And even though she did not run, in 1952, only 22 years after the ratification of the 19th Amendment, Charlotta Bass did as the vice presidential nominee for the Progressive Party. It was 48 years ago that Shirley Chisholm mounted her campaign for the White House. Now, she ran to win, but she knew she wasn't going to win. The goal was to pull together enough delegates to be in a position to negotiate with the winning candidate on behalf of the rights of women and the Black and Indigenous communities. Now, to put that in context, that was the same year that Joe Biden was first elected to the U.S. Senate from Delaware and Kamala Harris was just starting second grade. So history and context matters because as James Baldwin reminds us, history is not the past, it is the present. W.B. Du Bois said that the cost of liberty is less than the price of repression. We are now 11 months into a global pandemic. The economy appears to be crashing down around us. We are on the brink of an eviction crisis. The Supreme Court is now 6-3 right-leaning, the president has yet to concede. Mitch McConnell is going back to D.C. And we are close to having 10 million people infected with COVID-19. My topic tonight, which I believe could not be more appropriate, is Black COVID stories, Black Lives Matter and protest, a conversation about the ongoing struggle for justice and change. My hope is to address some of these issues and open up the space to continue to think deeply about what type of world we want to live in and what type of world we want to leave our children. I want to suggest to you that at this moment and at this time, we are standing on hollow ground, on holy ground, stolen land, where our blood is mixed with the soil. Frederick Douglass in 1848 said that Black people had grown up with this country and had watered the soil with our tears, nourished it with our blood, tilled it with our hands. We had a right to lay claim to the American dream. And at that moment, we were enslaved when he was telling this story. We were fighting for the right to be recognized. Today, those words have the same type of weight as we are consciously and actively fighting for freedom. We are living in a time when Black people are being shot simply because they are committing the crime of breathing and moving and being wild Black. I think when you talk about the enormity of this moment and you recognize that in the midst of a global pandemic for Black people, we are in the midst of a syndemic. And a syndemic talks about multiple points of oppression coming at you at one time. It's not just COVID-19 impacting the Black community. It's also the history of redlining. It's also living in a food desert. It's also what's happening in our schools. It's also what's happening with the economy. It's the fact that we are unable to live and be free in this country, and it is impacting us. So we are in a, a syndemic in this moment. When we look at what it means to protest, we are only one step away. Coretta Scott King said, freedom is never really won. You have to earn it and win it in every generation. The first documented black protest happened in this country 312 years before the beginning of the modern civil rights movement, uh, back in 1642. 
11 enslaved men and women petitioned for and won their freedom and land from the Council of New Netherland, later renamed New York. Since then, as laws begin to be enacted, which were specifically designed to restrict our rights, we have continued to organize, to petition, to fight, and to die for our freedom. I think what is interesting that part and parcel of the American dream is the struggle for Black people to live out their dreams in this country and what that means to always have your back against the wall and feel like you have to fight to be free. We know what it's like to have to face the full power of whiteness and not be moved or cowered into defeat. Now, it's important to note that this desire to be free, which is to be equal and to be unrestricted in movement and opportunity, has always been in the hearts and minds of Black people in this country. It's always been in the hearts and minds of immigrants in this country. It's always been in the hearts and minds of indigenous people in this country. It's always been in the hearts and minds of Hispanic people in this country. Struggle is as much a part of our American experience as racism and whiteness, which are the twin cousins of white supremacy because they flow from and into one another. White supremacy by all accounts is exhausting. It is dangerous and it is frightening, but it is a thread that is woven into the fabric of our country. And even if we pull on it, unless we are willing to pull the entire fabric apart, we will never be free from it. This lived experience is interesting because as a researcher and a black woman, I'm often struck by the ways that whiteness is used as both a shield and a battering ram. See, it happened during my father's generation as they fought to integrate this country. And it's happening now during my son's generation as they're fighting to make Black Lives Matter to everyone. The struggle to be free is as simple as a porcelain water fountain versus a stone one. Eating on the inside of a restaurant versus ordering your food from a back door in the alley. Paying your money and getting on the front of the bus versus paying your money at the front door and then getting off and getting back on at the back door. It is about being mistreated and about being invisible. We have seen changes in this country over the last 100 years. But in thinking about it, we have to understand that in order for oppression and racism and white supremacy to end, then we're talking about the hearts and minds of people. I believe, as you know on the screen, that protests and slogans are worthless if our children cannot get home safely every single night. We can march every day, we can protest every day, but if our children are still being shot in the street, then nothing is working in this society. Now, Dr. King, who I tend to study his work and think about what he wrote, I go back to the letter from a Birmingham jail. And Frederick Douglass said, if there's no struggle, there's no progress. Dr. King really opened this up with the letter from a Birmingham jail in the midst of the children's campaign. While he was sitting there, a lot of people thought that this letter was just kind of a simple statement about where he was at that moment. It really was an open indictment to white silent ministers. He was calling them into question and he wrote, I have almost reached a regrettable conclusion that the Negro's great stumbling block in his stride toward freedom is not the white citizens council or the KKK, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. I read Dr. King's letter from Birmingham jail this weekend when I took a hard look at the numbers from this election. What is it that concerns us more? Staring in the hardcore face of white supremacists? or living next door to someone who celebrates with us, but then silently votes for Mitch McConnell to go back to DC? Is it meeting racists head on 
when they are protecting buildings with AR-15s or sitting down at our office talking about what's happening in DC with the same person who voted to send Lindsey Graham back to Washington? Is it about making our way through a city, trying to protect ourselves, knowing at the same time that 71 million people in this country voted to continue with the presidency of Donald Trump? If there is no struggle, there is no progress. When we speak our truth into the wind, we force this country to bear witness and to not look away. During the 1850s, abolitionist William Still used to record the names and stories of hundreds of enslaved people who were fleeing to freedom on the Underground Railroad, which I think is fascinating when you think about it. Coming through Philadelphia, one of the things he made sure he did as a conductor, so he wasn't Harriet Tubman and Moses, which is moving people along the station. He kind of saw himself as an old guard standing there to make sure that you recorded your name in this moment in history. And when the war started, he buried these papers in the cemetery. He wanted to make sure that this information was preserved. Thinking about that, and what does it mean to have your life written down, to have your moment recorded? What does it mean to struggle for freedom on a constant basis, knowing that all we're trying to do is find a reservoir of hope and optimism, as Angela Davis said. Between 1920 and 1938, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People used to hang a flag out the window of their Manhattan office that read, a man was lynched yesterday. That I think is a powerful statement to make. It is as powerful as us saying Black Lives Matter. That was the Twitter of that day. And since they couldn't get on people's phones because that didn't exist, they hung a flag out. Ida B. Wells wrote about it, that a man was lynched, which meant you needed to stop. You, you needed to bear witness. You needed to recognize that something happened. It's the same way that we stood when Mike Brown was left to die in the street. The same way that we stopped and we gasped when we saw that video of Tamir Rice being shot in 1.67 seconds. It's the same way that we had to pull back as we listened to Eric Garner shouting, I can't breathe as we saw George Floyd on the ground. It's that same moment of stopping and saying, something is happening here. Racism has been shown to actually psychologically impact Black people, that it steals years from our life because it keeps us in a point of tension and stress. In 1968, my, my Nana, who was a, a nurse, one of the first Black nurses in South Carolina, she said she taped a sign to her hospital locker that read, Black people are dying today so we can be free tomorrow. And Nana said she would put the sign up and that when she would go home and come back the next day, the sign would be ripped up and either thrown in the trash or on the ground. And so she would write it again and put it back up there. That Black people are dying today so we can be free tomorrow. In 2015, the African-American Policy Forum, led by Kimberly Crenshaw, launched a hashtag Say Her Name campaign to document the names and stories of Black women and girls who had died at the hands of racist police violence. See, we, we tell our stories as a way of recording our pain, as a way of being remembered, as a way of standing tall in the face of fear and seeking to be free anyway. At the beginning of March, I launched hashtag Black COVID Stories as a way to record and remember and recognize our pain. COVID-19 is devastating the Black and Brown community. And nationwide, we are dying at double the rate of our state population. We are standing at the center of America's viral, racial, and economic epidemic. When the virus began to rapidly spread across the globe and across America, we were told to, to wait and see. We were told to stand by that it was going to disappear. I knew then 
that our communities once hit would be devastated. We live in a country where black men have the lowest life expectancy. Black men die four years earlier than white men, seven years earlier than black women, and nine years earlier than white women. Black women who are three to four times more likely to die from pregnancy related causes than white women have the worst maternal mortality rate of any industrialized country. Indeed, and in fact, more black women are dying during childbirth than died during the latter half of slavery in this country. This is why black physicians matter. And at this moment, black people only account for 5% of the physicians in this country because we talk to doctors that don't look like us and don't believe us when we speak about our pain and it ends up taking our very lives from us. In 2019, black men and boys were two and a half times more likely than white men and boys to die during an encounter with the police we have the highest poverty rates the highest unemployment numbers and we disproportionately suffer from the underlying health conditions such as diabetes chronic lung disease and cardiovascular disease that led to the most severe cases of COVID 19. in april my dad contacted me because he had found that a number of his friends were going to go and attend a funeral. My dad's a pastor and a bishop, and one of their friends had died. And I was alarmed. I just could not imagine. Even before the shut-in, I was screaming, Dad, you just can't go. You absolutely cannot go to a funeral. I know I was frantic. I was telling my mom to, to take his keys. I'm like, do something to keep him home. Now, ultimately, he decided not to go. My father's a grown man, made his decision. But coming out of that funeral, the number of people who were infected and ended up either in the hospital or dying from one event early on before they told us about super spreading activities. When America began to act to slow the spread of the virus, when schools were closed and people were told to work from home, in our community, one out of five black workers can work from home. So if you look at the numbers, that's just 20%. That's it. The other 80% of the black and the brown communities have to go to work. They, they move very quickly from, from being considered to be invisible labor, right? To being essential labor. Who is it that takes a job at Giant and you're willing to die for? And I think there's a lot of classism that has to be unpacked, even with the shut-in. Because for someone like me to stay home, other people who look like me had to go to work to continue to hold up this country, even while we fight to get an increase to a $15 minimum wage. Even though Black people are roughly 13.1% of the population, we represent 30% of the bus drivers, about 20% of all food service workers, janitors, cashiers, and store stockers. We did not and still do not have the luxury to stay at home. And we're experiencing the impact of this reality on our communities. Black women are more likely to test positive for COVID-19 and black men are more likely to die. COVID-19, I would argue, has aged me. I'm now weathered, I would argue, in ways that I cannot even begin to imagine. I think I've become my grandmother in so many ways, who used to say with a sigh that you reach a point in your life when nothing that white America does surprises you. Now, my nan as a nurse, she said that when white, when white folks lost a finger, they took our arm. And if they lost a toe, we knew our foot was going to be next. When they were sad, they made sure we were depressed. And when they got a cold, we knew we were going to get pneumonia. And what we found is that when they got COVID-19, we died from it. She said that Black folks had learned over time how to weather the storms of white America. And we do it because we are resilient. We do it because we are survivors. And we do it, she would say very wearily, uh, because when the only choices left are the start of the morning and the ending of the night, Black folks will always choose a new beginning. In unpacking Black COVID stories, particularly as we stand now with almost 10 million 
people being infected in this country and 50 million worldwide. This pandemic has been coming and been happening for a long time. This is the storm. This is what happens when it's morning time in Black America, when it's morning time in Brown America, when we are once again reminded that it is not America at war that concerns us, but it's America as war that keeps us up at night. We probably should have seen the morning coming. Nina Simone said that freedom in this country means you have no fear. I don't know what that feels like. I don't know what it means to not have any fear as the global leader of COVID-19. When we look across the landscape of this country, there are days when I feel that this endemic, which is a term that was introduced by Meryl Sanger, which talks about those multiple points of oppression and hostility that I pointed out, that it, it just might break us all. That there are days when I feel that when there's nothing left to take from us, that, that they're gonna take our soul. And these are the days when I get so frustrated and I feel tired in my spirit because I know that America will survive this pandemic, America writ large. A vaccine will come, life will move on, and things will go back to whatever the new normal is. I wonder though, what will happen to the most economically challenged black and brown communities in America? Communities that never actually came back after the 1968 riots. Communities that have never actually survived or moved forward from Black Lives Matter. Communities that are still trying to find places to get fresh fruits and vegetables in their community. Communities where you can't walk in those neighborhoods and be completely safe. What will happen to them once a vaccine happens? And given the fact that we have a history of medical racism and medical apartheid in this country, not just with the HeLa cells, with Henrietta Lacks, we can go back to Tuskegee experiment and the ways in which they experimented on black women during slavery to figure out the ways in which they can then heal white bodies. We are the descendants of men and women who chose to survive and they did it by gathering together. So I, I was thinking a lot as I was looking at the Maya Angelou uh, quote, that the need for change bulldozed a road down the center of my mind. I thought about resilience in the Black community, and I thought about the, the notion that, that Black people gather, that Brown people gather, that Indigenous people gather, that that's something that is part of the ways in which we live out our experience in this country, that we are the descendants of men and women who chose to survive. And they did it by gathering together. In moments of grief, we gathered. In moments of sorrow, we gathered. In moments of frustration and pain, terror and fear, we gathered. When they told us that our children were not good enough, we gathered. When they told us to send our children into white schools to be one of only nine or one only, we gathered and we did it. When they told us we have to show up to vote, so that we can change America, we gathered and we did it. The historic election that we just had in 2020, just a few days ago, 2020 feels like it's been a decade, let's be very clear. It has been the longest decade of my life. This last election laid bare what has essentially been wrong with this country. America historically does not vote in record numbers. We have very dismal voting numbers, with, with a few exceptions. There was a big dip uh, with Barack Obama, that election in, in 2008 when people you know, rallied and they, they partied and they cheered and they got out in record numbers. That was a big year uh, for elections because two things happened that year. One, Black women for the first time had the highest percentage of voters across the board. And second, that was the highest number of people to vote since 1968. Like going back to Nixon, that was the highest number of people to vote under Barack Obama. Our numbers at the time were like 67%, which is huge for America. Since then, coming out of that first election of Barack Obama, our numbers dropped. And by the time we got to 2016, we were at 52, 51%. 
And, and to put that in context, out of 35 developing or developed nations in terms of voting, we rank number 30 out of 35 in terms of voter turnout. I think there was a sense that democracy was not something you had to protect, that we have seen this country work what we thought were laws written in stone, it was really social norms. We just assumed that candidates would release their tax records and, until Donald Trump did. We just assumed that, that the president would work to protect us and, until Trump did. We just assumed that the president would turn a blind eye to personal gain, a blind eye to a lack of humanity and civility until Trump did. Like we just assumed that these things would happen without us working to make it so. And what we found over the last four years is that it woke people up. We saw people galvanized. You saw more women, more people of color voted into office. Democracy is something that we have to shape. When we were trying to understand what does it mean to have a survival plan, Part of the survival plan for folks of color in this country is not just about being brave, because sometimes we equate being brave with being able to survive. It really is about being smart, right? So we are smart now so that we can gather later. We are smart in our decisions around voting so we can move forward later. We are smart in the ways in which we move through society. I say that we have to be twice as vigilant when it comes to not just police brutality, but to COVID-19, that you live a, at a time when you have to balance both. And I'm not saying we haven't done it before. Black COVID stories meets Black Lives Matter shows that we are a strong-willed and stubborn people. It shows that we understand every time we have a struggle that we have nothing to lose but our chains. I am the daughter of a native South Carolinian. My dad grew up in the Jim Crow South. And he remembers the days when they called him boy, even when he was a man. He remembers being dismissed and overlooked even when he followed the rules and of hearing his mother cry when she realized that he had decided to fight back and not give way. These are the type of decisions, he would say, that are best made once you realize that you're willing to die to be free rather than live in fear under the thumb of whiteness. Now, my father's family carried pistols and shotguns whenever they rode into town. The other thing is, remember Jim Crow, South Carolina. My granddaddy used to sit on a pillow when he was driving, and underneath the pillow on the right side, he would have his pistol just, just in case he needed to grab it in a hurry. His sons, my father and his brothers, would, would have shotguns on the floor near their feet. Now, nobody ever said it, but everybody knew that if the Klan confronted them, then they were prepared to meet their maker standing up and fighting back. The reality of living in a Southern county where performative whiteness manifests itself through the law and through daily acts of random domestic terror against Black people. We can say that's South Carolina, Lexington County, we can say that's Baltimore City, you know, up south. We can say that's Philadelphia. We can say that's New York. We can spread that out to all the red states that push out from the East Coast until we get to California. It was not unusual for Black women to, to gather together and share horrific tales of lynchings and cross burnings. They would gather according to my nana, over sweet potato pie and what she called integrated coffee, right? <laughs> they would gather and they would talk and they would cry and they would lift each other up. It was not uncommon for Black households to keep an open Bible on the coffee table and a loaded shotgun at the door. That everybody knew how to shoot, how to steady their shoulder, set your arm so that your hands never 
wager. My Nana grew up on a farm way down south, so she knew how to pick cotton and twist off a chicken's head, grab her shotgun, look white terror in the eyes, and not look away. My father said that the best time to plant a tree, and many of you have heard this before, was 50 years ago, right? And the second best time was today. Well, he used to turn that and say that the best time to fight against whiteness was five minutes before the Klan showed up. Like you have to make a decision about where you're going to stand before you see the white sheets out your front window. It's interesting because this week as I was talking with my father, asking him about Emmett Till, and I brought that up because of the young gentleman in Louisiana, and they're drawing parallels between his recent death to Emmett Till back in 1955. My dad says at that time when they were talking about money Mississippi that all the mothers and all the women in the church were weeping and wailing during the Sunday church service. And that the pastor asked them questions that he said he never forgot. What kind of men could look a boy in the eye and then torture him to death. How much effort would it take for us to love the hell out of white people's hearts and minds? Similar to what Dr. King said, that we have to love the hell, the evilness, the racism, the white supremacy out of our neighbors. He said the murder of Emmett Till for him changed everything. And after that, there was this unspoken agreement that black boys had to be taught if they wanted to stay alive, you, you can't look white women in the eye, you don't speak first, and you don't get too excited, you don't wear anything on your head, and you don't laugh out loud, like you follow all these rules just so you can get home safely. Growing up, it was hard for me to understand how someone could be arrested for being black and for laughing. How someone could be lynched because they didn't step off the sidewalk quick enough. How, how is it that someone could go to jail because they looked somebody else in the eye of a different race? I, I thought these were just longtime stories. Until, of course, between Black Lives Matter 1.0, which is what I call the first Black Lives Matter to happen in this country, which many people did not recognize that moment, to what was happening just two years ago, when every time Black people moved in this country, somebody was calling the cops on us for simply living our lives. It's akin to the Langston Hughes quote where he says, I swear to the Lord, I still can't see why democracy means everybody but me. Now in that poem, Langston Hughes goes on to say that he swears to God that it will be. He's going to make America, America. America will be democracy to Black people. It's what we fight for when we show up at the polling place. We fight to help the democracy that has been denied to us for so long be realized in this country. When my son was four years old, and this is my boys who call themselves Dr. Whitehead, and they still do to this day, who remind me often of why I fight so hard. It's my sons are the reason why I became the Black Mommy activist. When I left UMBC, I was convinced that my work was going to be in the archives. I was studying 19th century Black women's history. I was looking at the diaries of a free black woman from 1863 to 1865. I had everything laid out perfectly. I had a path forward for how I was going to get to tenure. I'm like, I'm going to focus on bringing black women into the canon. I said, I can hide myself in the archives and I can have a freedom there. No one's going to bother me. <laughs> I can simply live my life. I mean, it was, it was a beautiful dream when I, when I graduated. I was like, this is who I'm going to be, a professor of history in my office, surrounded by my books and surrounded by the ghost of the past. And that changed for me with the death, the murder of Trayvon Martin. That was in 2015 and in 2014. And when I realized that for me, if I can't do the work in this country that will allow my own sons to get home free and safe, 
If I cannot transform this society, then nothing that I'm going to do in the archives will make a difference. And that was a different shift for me. People wonder, how did you move from the archives into the radio? I made a decision that I was gonna take my work to where the people were located. I was gonna go to where people were actually gathering to have that conversation. And, and I was guided by, by something that, that happened in 1965. Now, back in 1965, President Lyndon Baines Johnson, in response to the violent racial attacks that were happening throughout the country, stated that the problem that this country was facing was neither a Negro problem nor a Southern problem. LBJ said it was an American problem. And speaking before a joint session of Congress, he argued that the nation had to work together to overcome the crippling legacy of bigotry and injustice. Now, he was preparing Congress and the world to receive his bill, which would later become the 1965 Voting Rights Act that was designed to eliminate illegal barriers that prevented Black people from exercising their legal right to vote. It was that, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, that opened up the way so that Black women and Hispanic women and Asian American women and Indigenous women can get to the ballot, that we don't celebrate completely the 19th Amendment, the Black women and the vote. We celebrate the 1965 Voting Rights Act. I think it's interesting because at that moment, there seemed to have been a movement to work hard against it, to get back to a point where the right to the ballot, the right to the vote could be denied simply because of the color of your skin. We saw that in 2013 with the Shelby County Beholder case and how it attacks Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act, the Pre-Clearance Act, which led to what we see now, the type of voter suppression and voter intimidation that Black and Brown people have been dealing with in this country. The question that Lyndon Baines Johnson wanted answered, he was trying to figure out if it's not a Negro problem, and it's not a Southern problem, it's not an American problem, then why are the cities on fire? What has happened? Why can't we get this under control? And they said he was deeply troubled by this. And by 1967, when you had communities on fire throughout the country, he put together a commission. Now, it's interesting that at the time, in order to get an answer for what do Black people want, he put together a commission of all white men, but, but somehow that made sense to him, right? Let me get a commission of all white men, go figure out what do Black people want? How do we get them to calm down? How do we get them to stop setting their communities on fire? How do we get them to shut up? And with the Colonel Commission of 1968, talking about the questions of what does it mean to be an American? Who has a right to claim this country as their own? The Colonel Commission on the Isle of Kerr said that really Black folks just, just want a couple of things. Want to be able to live in a safe community. Want to be able to make enough money to take care of their families. Want to be able to send their children to strong and solid schools. I mean, they're talking about just wanting to be free in this country. Now, Lyndon Baines Johnson chose to reject what they said. He said, well, I'm doing a lot for the Black community. How much more do they want? And nothing was done. It's the same issue. When they redid that study 30 years later in 1998 with the Eisenhower Foundation, the question was, okay, it's 1998, we've come so far. How are the black communities doing now? How are the brown communities doing now? And again, the Eisenhower Foundation and a commission made up entirely of white people trying to figure out how black folks are doing and how brown folks are doing said really it's the same issues. America is more black and brown than ever before. It's more divided now. And what they're looking for is to live in a safe neighborhood to make enough money to take care of their family, to send their children to, to strong schools. And it was rejected in 1998. When it was redone 50 years later in a multicultural committee, we took a look at the 50th anniversary of the Kerner Commission. How is the black community doing? How's the brown community doing? How are we doing as a nation? And what they found in 2018, they said, we are more divided now than ever that what we need in this country is what they said in 1968. We need new attitudes, new understanding, and above all new will that it would take every white American to bend their privilege and speak up against the reign 
of terror, that the time for contemplative silence and social media activism has ended. If we're talking about transforming this nation, if we're talking about pulling this country back from the brink of disaster, if we recognize even though we're celebrating Joe Biden and Kamala Harris, who made history going into Washington, D.C., when they get inaugurated on January 20th at 12 p.m. and they're dragging out the old president, at 12.01, racism hasn't ended. At 12.02, white supremacy is not over. At 12.03, Black folks are still not making equal pay for our jobs. At 12.04, the Brown community is still struggling. At 12.05, we still have massive unemployment. At 12.06, our schools are still going to be underfunded. All this is what we're talking about when we look to do the hard work. So when my son at four years old asked me, what did a Black feminist look like? When I was becoming, you know, I call myself the Black Mommy Activist. Like I'm a Black feminist. I don't even know what that means yet, but that's who I am at this moment. So I can do the hard work. I told them then that if I do my job right, that every single time they looked in the mirror, that they will see what a Black feminist looks like. I realized that no matter how far we have come, this country still has a long way to go before it can both recognize and practice equity and social justice. I believe, and, and this is not easy to hear, I believe that we're in the midst of some dark days and we have more dark days to come before we get to the light. I believe the morning is going to come. I believe we're at just a, a day away from tomorrow. But in order for us to get there, we have to recognize that when we show up to vote, when we show up to do the work, that we may not benefit from it, that we're doing it for our children. And we fight white complicity and privilege, and we fight white nationalism and white supremacy. We're doing it because we recognize that if this country is going to change, if we're going to come through the storm one small step at a time, and we will all grab our weapons, whether that's your pen, your paper, whether it's the book you're writing or the voice you're speaking with. And we're going to be well trained and brilliant. And we're going to be the hope and the dreams of our ancestors. And doing that, then I believe we will win to transform the society. Maybe not for us, but for the children of our children is who I think we should fight for. Thank you so much. Whoa. What a fantastic talk. <laughs> <laughs> While we wait for questions to be submitted on Q&A, I will start uh, with a question. <clears throat> on Saturday, uh, Joe Biden, the president-elect, at his victory speech, said that African-Americans have had his back, and he promised that he would have theirs. So my question is, how could African Americans optimize this unique relationship with the incoming administration to advance their interests? I think that within the black community, when I look at the work that has been done to get us this to this point, I look at the work of Stacey Abrams, who is a formidable presence, uh, who will not be silenced, who had an election stolen from her, and then she worked to transform Georgia to put it in contention. Georgia, deeply racist, deep South. And you know, according to the numbers, that she single-handedly helped to get like 800,000 people registered. I think about Keisha Bottoms uh, and the work that she's doing, you know, holding Atlanta together, making sure even when she had COVID-19, that Atlanta stayed in contention, fighting with the governor of Georgia, knowing that he's there illegally because that really Kemp should not be there. Thinking about the work of Maria Bowser, like the power it took to paint Black Lives Matter in the streets so that every time Donald Trump flew over, walked over, rode over, he went over a place where it was designated for Black people. That the work that Simone Sanders has done, I mean, I'm just naming a few Black women. Black voters matter, Black girls vote, that I think that Black women and Black men and Black people 
recognize in order for real transformation to come, we do not put our hope and our dreams in one person anymore. Those days are gone. We're not looking for a savior to ride in and make us free and to help us to recognize. It's like either Joe Biden's going to get with the program or we're going to organize around him because there's too much at stake right now. We cannot wait. We don't want any more symbolism. Kamala Harris is on that ticket, not just to be there and standing in support. It's the fight for the work that she's been doing throughout. The people that are gathered together have a long record of fighting for our communities. And I think that's going to continue. Yes, Black folks did have his back. Let's be clear. Joe Biden should have dropped out a long time ago. I mean, if, if you look at just the numbers, Joe Biden was not winning. And Jim Clyburn from South Carolina told him, hey, just hang on, brother. I got you when you get to South Carolina. You're going to lose everything. No worries. When you get to South Carolina, Black folks got you. And it transformed everything. It also made us realize that from that very diverse field of qualified candidates, that the Democratic Party made a decision that the only person that could beat a white man in their 70s was another white man in their 70s, which to me should be the last time we're at this place. And we have to organize. We can't get comfortable. We can't take our feet off the gas. We can't have another eight years of partying under Obama. We have to work every day to continue to get people elected and registered and to stay as politically and actively engaged as they were over the last four years to continue with that over the next four years. I think we also pressured Joe Biden to do one term and actually do some work to get Kamala Harris groomed. She's overqualified to be VP, but start opening up the way for her candidacy. Don't, don't get in power and love it. And you want to do eight years and you're you know, moving into your 90s. No, dude, do it. Do your do your four years of healing and then have a succession plan, which I think is what the Democratic Party needs to take more seriously. I'm Gloria. I just wanted to <laughs> thank you. Gloria. Yes. I just wanted to remind uh, people because I see some questions being added in the chat. Um, I, please uh, put your questions in the QA portion of the window. So if you go to the bottom right of the screen, you'll see the three dots. Um, and that's where you open the Q&A. Please type your questions in there as opposed to the chat so that we, we can all see them. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, one of the questions uh, we have um, is the, some, or <clears throat> some organizations claim diversity by hiring one person of color for sure. This person is not really valued as um, an employee, but it rather used for the organization to be able to say they are diverse when they're not. How can we contest or change this? It's interesting because in her uh, her speech, Kamala Harris said something that, that Black women have, have often said, that I may be the first, but I won't be the last. That black women know that when you get into the room, the goal is to prop the door open so that other people can come with you. The goal is to not allow yourself to be the token one and then become comfortable with that because that makes whiteness comfortable with what they're doing. You are the one, so the burden goes on you. You have to do the work. You have to be the person to stand up and represent how diverse we are, but it doesn't show up in your pay. It doesn't show up when they respect you. It doesn't show up when they ask you to do the work. Unfortunately, there's a certain amount of sacrifice and pushing to get to that point. How do we begin to mobilize the power that we have so that we're not isolated in these positions? It's what Black faculty members have to deal with. They play their schools that we're not in huge numbers. And until we begin to organize better and begin to support one another and to be more strategic, it is about picking one or two and showing you where we are diverse because we have one or two at the table and they are not protected and they are isolated and they are alone. That's not the way the world is going to work anymore. I think we have to change that agenda and it's going to call for us to be more strategic, to organize and be a little bit better on how we do it. But it also means we may have to pass up opportunities. And I know people don't want to talk about that. Do you want to be the only black person in the building? That just sounds so isolating. The question is, how do I use this moment to negotiate for more? Can you do a blanket hire? When you bring in four black faculty members at a time, 
and then we can support each other. Who's going to mentor me while I'm there? What, what is the support system that we no longer take every crumb that's being offered just because we're hungry? We understand that just like they're hiring us, we are hiring them too. And then we walk in with the list of things that we want to have met before we say yes, because we're filling their quota. What can we get at that moment that we can walk away and be comfortable using the power that we have at the right moments to get the agenda met that we have? Thank you. There's a question on Stacey Abrams. And the question says um, how we can get her uh, to the DNC chair. How can we <laughs> to be the DNC chair? <laughs> I, I think Stacey Abrams, who who's just amazing. Uh, I think Stacey Abrams will have her pick of what she wants to do. I want Stacey Abrams to run for president. Like We all have goals for Stacey Abrams. What I think is most fascinating about Stacey Abrams is not just her political work, right? I look at the other part of the self-care that she does. I mean, she's a fiction writer. She gets on Twitter having conversations about Buffy the Vampire Slayer because she really loves Buffy and that world. That to me is about self-care. That what we don't want, and this has happened so often with Black women, that we become the mules of this world, right? So we have a black woman like Stacey Abrams who is talented, who's brilliant, and we want her to do all the work and we work her like a, a mule plow until it's done, until the next black woman comes along. We're, we're not doing that anymore. It's, it's about self-care. It's about balance. It's about writing your own ticket. You are brilliant. You do stand in your power and you don't have to pick up the entire race or the entire country on your shoulders. I know black women have done a lot of the organizing work. Hey, we gotta talk about self-care because black women are also dying at high rates when it comes to tension and stress and obesity and hypertension and high blood pressure, heart attacks and cancer affecting black women because we have been taught that we have to be strong. We have to do everything all the time. It was that way during slavery. It was that way during the civil rights movement. It's been that way through Black Lives Matter. And now we need to find a way to say no. So I am not supporting Stacey Abrams trying to push her to be the DNC chair. Let Stacey Abrams make a choice about what she wants to do. She is never going to be more powerful than she is at this moment. What do you want to do, Stacey Abrams? They stole from you and you showed them how it was done. Who do you want to be right now? Because your job is not to put on the cape and save this country at the expense of your own life. Because when you're dead and gone, they'll write great books about you, but you won't be here. There's a question on Baltimore. And the question says, what do you think are the most important tax for us in Baltimore? Oh, well, I, I talk about Baltimore City a lot. Um, Baltimore City, which is you know where I'm located, I, I have adopted Baltimore City as my home. Um, I've been here, I don't know what, 18 years. People tell me I just got here yesterday. I understand I'm still new to Baltimore, but the issues that are part of what's happening in Baltimore are not new issues. Our homicide numbers are rising. But, but I, I know that that particular need is being met by people like Erica Bridgeford and the work she's doing with Baltimore Ceasefire. I think about, oh, we need to work on our schools. And then I look at Diamond Tay Brown, who's the president of the BTU. And I'm like, okay, so somebody's working on that. I'm like, what about helping to empower our children? Wait a minute, Dee Watkins is part of putting books into the school. And I think about, well, how about leadership? No, no, Brandon Scott seems to be right around their age and they feel like he's one of them. One of the amazing things about Baltimore City is you have so many people doing the work. If you're out bike riding, that's okay. We got Brittany Young with B360. But there is a space for the kind of organizing that's happened, which is why I am excited about what is taking place in Baltimore City. I think it's a microcosm of America. Baltimore City is showing how the work gets done. People are loving into this city. Are the problems gone? No. But when you attack our city like Donald Trump did, you will see people spring up in defense. When our children are marching, you will see people join them to make sure they can get down there safely and get home. When we're talking about Black Lives Matter, you have Tawanda Jones, who stands every Wednesday on behalf of her brother Tyrone West. We are doing the hard work across the board. I think it's no accident that Baltimore City is one of only five places in the country that has a black woman with an afternoon drive time talk show. That is unusual. Baltimore City is where it's happening. We have these conversations 
every day. It is vibrant here and it is growing. So I don't think Baltimore is going to have any issues. We're going to survive because we're scrappy. And we know what it means to have the world against us and to push against that anyway. So the conversations that are happening in Baltimore City, just get on Baltimore Twitter. We're having them every day. And we're coming up with solutions and we're laughing through our pain and we're figuring out how we can survive, not just Black COVID stories and police brutality, but survive each other. The next question is, how can we solve the problem of Black on Black violence in our communities? Maybe start by not calling it Black on Black violence. I think it's... <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, maybe we start at the beginning, only because when you say black on black violence, it, it, it evokes all kinds of imagery, right? As if black folks are predisposed to hurting and killing each other. Nobody talks about white on white violence. Nobody talks about Hispanic on Hispanic violence. Black on black violence is a deliberate term designed and created by the media as a way of boxing in blackness, people tend to commit more crimes in their own communities against people that look like them. So how do we solve the problem of violence in the black community? We start by thinking about what is leading to the violence. What can we do to transform our school so that children can see themselves beyond their situation? What's happening in the community? How do we get more green space in the community so that young people have a place to go? How do we have more internships coming through the community? How do we have more mentors coming into the community? How do we attack this problem by offering alternative routes to who you want to be? So that's how we solve it. Will it get solved overnight? No, it won't. Violence has been a part of this country, I don't know, since the beginning. What did Jesus Christ say? The poor will always be with you. I think violence will too. So the question is, how do we decrease it? How do we get our children to make a decision to live? I think it's interesting to have this conversation in the middle of Black COVID stories, when we're watching white communities make the opposite decision. Like, if we're going to talk about, you know, can be violence within the black community. Let's talk about internalized violence within the white community. Let's talk about the fact that for the first time in history, that when you talk about the survival rates, the mortality rates for the white community have gone down because of suicide and depression and alcoholism and opioid drug use. Let's talk about that. That's not necessarily shooting and killing your neighbor, but something's going on that we need to talk about. It's easy for us to research down. There's something happening in the Black community, so they need us. Let's take a look across the aisles as well, because communities are suffering across the board. It's no mistake that Texas has hit 1 million cases of COVID-19 in a deeply red state that is standing behind a leader. I think there are a lot of issues around violence that go beyond just sticking somebody up. And we got to talk about the problem of violence that's happening throughout this country in every single community and in our own households, because we cannot overlook the fact that domestic violence and child abuse have both gone up this year, gone undocumented this year because of the COVID-19 shut in. That's a question on the reason why you moved uh, from the archives <laughs> to radio and how, what do you think um, academics um, <laughs> and uh, why it is imperative. So it's interesting. Their decision and uh, how difficult was it? Okay, so I don't even know if I would call myself an academic anymore. Um, I, I am a public intellectual. I, I received tenure from Loyola back in 2015, and I did it on the strength of my research. It was because of my book. Notes from a Colored Girl, which was my dissertation, winning those awards and doing articles that helped me get tenure. I just made a decision that that's not who I wanted to be anymore. It was a personal decision because I have two young African-American sons and I'm like, I don't understand what I'm doing here if my son is the same age as Tamir and Tamir gets shot in the park, I can't hide in the archives and drink coffee. I got to go out and change this. So I began you know, working to become a Black Lives Matter trainer. I started traveling around the country and doing that work. I also made a decision, two-part decision. One is I informed my university, hey, this is who I'm going to be now. And if this is not the type of work that you want to support, if this is not what you see in terms of your faculty members, then maybe this isn't the place for me. I cannot be Black and be a mother in America 
and hide behind books. This is just me. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. It just what I could not sleep at night knowing that my sons could get shot just being in a store. I could not, not knowing that I wasn't doing everything I could to change that reality. So I began to write op-eds. I started writing op-eds for the Baltimore Sun because I had this crazy idea that, that a racist in Dundalk wouldn't buy notes from a colored girl, but a racist in Dundalk would grab a cup of coffee and open up the Baltimore Sun and read the op-eds there. So I'm like, let me take my work to where they are. I moved from writing in the Baltimore Sun to writing a column for the Afro. Um, I started giving a lot more keynotes, which is how I got to, to 500 plus. I spoke everywhere. I mean, if it was in a church basement, if it was in Wyoming, which I spoke in, Nevada, I mean, I've spoken in Klan country, you know, where they bring me in early morning and take me out before it gets too dark at night. <laughs> I've had, you know, death threats. Uh, I've had a stalker uh, because the work calls you to be in front of people that as an academic, you're not. I just don't work in the ivory tower. I started doing more radio. And then when WEAA offered me the opportunity to host my own radio show, and when I looked around and said, wow, there are very few black women doing this, this is huge. I also went back to my university and said, okay, I, I don't know how I can do everything. How do we make this work? Can, can you support me with this? And in my university changed my contract. So like I, I teach like everybody else, but my service is through my radio show. I'm like I make it so that I'm able to do this work because I know that when I carry the name of the university beyond the four corners of this office, I'm making the university look good. And that's something that we all have to agree upon. <laughs> I think that when you recognize, and this was not an easy journey, to say, okay, what is, what is my worth here? How do I want to be remembered? That when I look at myself in the mirror today, and I do, I have a dog, Bella Reds, and I, you know, Bella Reds talks to me, she, you know, tells me what's happening in, in my spirit, but I was walking with my dog and I was just thinking, how do I want to be remembered? And even back then, I never wanted to be remembered as someone who was a wonderful academic. That's not how I wanted to be remembered. I always wanted to be remembered as someone who loved hard, who worked to transform a society, someone who loved children and who believed that Black children can be free and because they're brilliant and that they're geniuses and that they are the ones that we should spark the genius and set them on fire and set them loose into the world. And if that is what I'm laying my life down for, then that is what I'm doing. And so my university has gotten behind it. I launched the Carson Institute for Race, Peace, and Social Justice two weeks ago today. I named the Carson Institute after my daddy so that I would have a place to do all of my work. I think that academics are called to be more engaged. I think because we can wrap what's happening with the research, we can unpack what's going on, we can speak with a little bit of authority, but we can transform what's happening. And I'm not saying go out and march, I did that. I marched with my sons until I realized I was maybe just a little bit too old to march with them, uh, particularly when they started telling me to get in the back and that they wanted to be in the front. And I recognized that for me, it's not about marching, that that's not where my journey is anymore. It's about writing, it's about speaking, it's about getting on the radio, and it's about finding a way to engage people with what I think are America's most urgent and pressing questions, which is around who are we in this country? Who do we want to be? And what type of world do we want to leave our children? Thank you. That's a question on how we can create a unity within the African diaspora. How can we create unity within the African diaspora? And, and that is a, a very difficult question that, <laughs> that I wrestle with in terms of what does unity look like? Um, when we talk about the African diaspora, I always start a little bit more simpler. I'm like, how do we create unity within the black community? <laughs> We're talking about trying to get unified uh, on the first, the first level, which is within our own community and then looking to expand that. I think that now um, there are universities around the country, I think in particular, say UNBC, which has a huge uh, immigrant population. I think of Lincoln University, where I went to undergraduate, where Kwame Nkrumah and Namdi Azikwe went there, and there's a huge population of students coming from the continent to study that are building uh, the, these connections and doing the work because we understand that the struggles that are happening in South Africa or in Ghana, 
right, are the struggles that are happening here. And just like our Ghanaian brothers and sisters stood with us, we were talking about Black Lives Matter, uh, George Floyd, we must stand with our Nigerian brothers and sisters when we talk about, you know, SARS. Like we have to, to be engaged. And I think that with what's happening with technology, we can now be more engaged and more outward facing. And that's how I think we build coalitions. Understanding that the struggles that we're facing as black people around the planet are more connected uh, than they are separate from each other. Thank you. Uh, the criminalization of colored bodies has long been an issue in the country. How do you think we can organize as a society to indicate the stigma? But when you start talking about the mass industrial prison complex and the work that Michelle Alexander did so brilliantly in her book, The New Jim Crow, when you think about how Ava DuVernay really paints the picture in her documentary, 13th, that what we're talking about is a multi-billion dollar business built on the enslaved bodies of black and brown people. Like we have to recognize that the 13th Amendment back in 1865 ended slavery everywhere except in the prison system. We have to think about the fact that when American slavery ended, Black men and boys were being snatched up off the street in order to build this system. Perhaps, and I believe this is true, perhaps with the new administration coming in, Perhaps with the men and women around the table who understand that part and parcel of this problem is not just the mass industrial prison complex, but also the disenfranchisement of black and brown people who were formerly incarcerated and they are, you know, re-entering as residents, fighting on those two levels and beginning to think about ways to keep juveniles out of the system. I think that you have two points of tension happening at the same time. One, you'll have people trying to do the work, trying to transform this system. The second part, I think, is the harder part to deal with. While, while we've been focused on Donald Trump's tweets, he has quietly stacked the courts. Donald Trump has pushed through 219 judges. And out of that, about 55 to 56 of them are on the appeals court level. Yeah, that's the highest court in the regions, right? So if it doesn't make it to the Supreme Court, it's on that appeals court. They, they are the gatekeepers of the region. When he did that with 219, which by the way, is more than Obama did in two terms, more than Clinton did. I mean, when you think about the enormity of what Donald Trump has done and what that majority Senate Republican, the party has done, to the way in which we're going to advance, it should take your breath away. Because Donald Trump, more than anybody else, he has put in right wing conservative white men that we the people is now they the people. Right wing conservative white men sitting there as appeals court judges will send more black and brown children to jail for longer sentences. White right wing conservative men sitting on every level of the court will lean and tilt this country in a direction that, as Mitch McConnell himself said, will take decades for us to actually undo. It is no secret that they pushed Amy Coney Barrett through, but think about a right-leaning court. Many of us held our breath on the 10th to just see what was going to happen, and to see Kavanaugh and Roberts perhaps flip over when it comes to the Affordable Care Act, we know what's also coming up this year, in addition to Roe v. Wade, is another look at the Voting Rights Act. So we can talk about transforming the system, and we do. We do things around the bail funds. We talk about ways to, to keep young, you know, young people out of the system. We're talking about you know, more re-entry programs. We're talking about how we can have more college programs in. We're talking about trying to find a way to just transform it with people like our Baltimore City State's attorney. We cannot overlook the fact that the courts right now are stacked against us. And it's the court that's going to determine what it's going to look. They determine how long you go away for. And I think that that is something that out of everything Donald Trump has done and has deeply disturbed me so many things, that's the one there that, that gives me pause, that gives me chills, knowing 
that we have a court system of young judges, by the way, young. I mean, he was known for putting in judges at like 48 and 49 and 50 years old in lifetime appointments, pretty much. So you're talking being there forever. Amy Coney Bear is 48. I mean, just think about it. I have a 20 year old son. When he's 30 and starting to get his family, she should only be 58. When he's you know 40 years old at that point, think about that. She'll only be 68. Like she'll just be getting started and figuring out where the bathrooms are, right? I mean, so you're talking a lifetime of shifting this country in a very right wing direction, which has been the long term goal of the Republican Party. They're calling it the right wing wave, and that's what it is. They don't mind losing seats because they have that particular branch of government, which shapes and controls laws and incidentally shapes and controls how black people show up in the mass industrial prison complex. Thank you. Uh, the next question uh, says that, uh, why do you think people like Andy Owens? And Republicans <laughs> choose to be ignorant towards <laughs> of black people um, and choose to focus towards uplifting white people. Um, I, I probably, I don't call Candace Owens uh, ignorant, I will say that, uh, because Black folks are not a monolith. I mean, you're free to follow anyone that you want to follow. She is standing tall uh, on her way probably to being a Fox correspondent, if that's what she wants to do. She's leading up a movement called Blexit, which is, you know, Blacks exiting the Democratic Party. Candace Owens, and don't get mad at me, y'all. Candace Owens, there's some points that she put out there to take a look, take a hard look at democratically controlled cities. What does it mean to have the same party have such a deep hold over a city? Should we start thinking about ways that the Black vote gets more diversified? Somebody's listening to Candace Owens because what, 8% of Black women did vote for Trump and what is it, 16% of Black men voted for Trump and 31% Hispanic men and 30% Hispanic women. Like there were a lot of folks. If you look at the New York Times latest polls, all the races and genders went up except for white men. They went down in terms of voting for Donald Trump. That, that there's a message there. That there's a, a deeper message that I, I like to divide the party uh, and the parties here in three parts. I think you have the Democratic Party, right? And in that you have a progressive wing and you can just kind of keep going. You have the Republican Party, but I think trump have to be pulled out because the research shows that Black men in particular, as they get older, tend to gravitate towards the Republican Party, which I think is very interesting. You start talking about taxes and you know, owning your house and talking about retirement and, and what does it mean to you know, buy into the system and to be able to get paid from it. I don't think Candace Owens is ignorant. I think Candace Owens was very strategic. Uh, people listen to her. And I think that when I listen to Candace Owens, even though I don't agree with everything that she says, I think we're doing ourselves a great disservice to completely dismiss her. I think as, as Black folks in particular, you know, specifically, uh, and then people more generally, that the last thing we want to do is to simply write someone off as ignorant just because we don't agree with what they're saying. Because there are people who support Joe Biden that are not very smart, in my opinion, but I just can't say, well, they're not ignorant because they support Joe Biden. No. Do they have something where when I listen to their message, what exactly are they crying out for? Candace Owens and Kimberly Clasick, if you want to add her in that, who was running here in Baltimore City, even though they did not win, right? And then, you know, Cam Kimberly Clasick did not, could, didn't have a chance here in Baltimore City. Was anything she said something that should challenge us? Because if you look at the state of our communities, some of our communities look the same way they did back in 1968. So what is happening? We've had, we've had Democratic mayors in this system right here in Baltimore City. What's going on? Why are our homicide numbers? Up? We have Black folks in positions of power across the board, from police commissioner to state's attorney to mayor to the you know, president of city council to the head of the Baltimore Teachers Union. Then, then what's the problem? Like, Why aren't we Wakanda? Maybe because we might be asking the wrong questions and maybe we should be demanding more that maybe for black folks who have consistently shown up for the Democratic Party and who've been discarded after they have won, let's be very clear. If Joe Biden delivers for black people, it will be a long time in coming because we've been waiting to have things delivered to us that were promised to us when people ran. Like, you know, they expect the black people to show up. We do, and they get in office, and all of a sudden they're the president of the entire United States. 
And that doesn't necessarily include being the president of Black people. I'm not saying Joe Biden has to just be our president. I'm saying put our issues on the table as well and give us as much time and attention as you're giving everyone else. Long answer, I think ignorant is, is something we should, we should think about whether or not there's any validity in what she's saying. And I would argue that there is. I'm, I'm concerned about the transformation of our communities and that the Democrats in so many ways have not done complete transformation that you would expect with our commitment to that party. Thank you. The next question uh, says uh, throughout history, we've seen that it is not simply disease. Uh, wait a minute. It is not simply disease, but rather socioeconomic inequality that has fueled the impact of pandemics like Ebola and AIDS. Mm -hmm. Both uh, pandemics, black and brown communities in America and globally were and still are significantly more impacted. Mm -hmm. Exact same thing seems to be happening with COVID-19. What can we do as members of the Baltimore community to try and break this dynamic? So I, I say this um, from a position of love. I love Baltimore City. I have to preface it that way. Um, but but I drive around Baltimore City a lot, and I want to yell out my window. I don't. I want to yell out my window. Hey, like we need to be more cautious. We need to think about what the reality of COVID nineteen is. We have to think about how it's impacting our community. What can we do in order to move our community forward and be safe? What is Mayor Young putting in place? Where it's wearing a mask, washing your hands. Like it sounds so simple except that we have communities that are not doing that. And I would argue, and as I have with, with Mayor Young, it's not just enough to say, wash your hands, wear a mask. It's, it's just not enough. Because if people don't have money coming into their household, they're not going, they can't isolate at home. If they don't have money to purchase all the supplies you're talking about, then isolating at home is not a choice. That we're talking about communities that don't have a lot of choices. They're shutting everything back down. For some communities, they were never shut down. They always had to be open. And so how do we organize within that? How do we take the reality of the situation, mind you, a situation that is out of control around the planet and try to control it here in Baltimore City? I'm a pessimist. I have optimist leanings. I'm, I'm a pessimist though. I don't know how we can control COVID-19 in Baltimore City when it's not being controlled anywhere. COVID-19 is raging out of control everywhere. 50 million people on this planet have COVID-19. I mean, that's just, it's incredible. We're at almost 10, that is incredible that California will have almost a million people infected with COVID-19. And yet we talk about sending our children back to school in Baltimore City. Private schools are shutting down now because they're having outbreaks. I understand shutting down. What can we do to make sure there's equity in the system so my child can learn at the same level at home as their independent school peers? I think we're talking about big things. I'm not a scientist. I don't study COVID-19 at all outside of how we're all studying it. I do know that when I think about Dr. Freeman Rabowski, who's going to be coming on my show to talk about this, how do we get black folks, more black folks into the trials? How do we get our community to want to take the vaccine from a country that has been so racist in their attitude and their actions toward us? I mean, how do I get in line for a vaccine when you just shot and killed, you know, Rashad Brooks because he fell asleep at Wendy's? Like, I don't know how to reconcile that. Like, these are big questions. You stole Henrietta Lacks' cells and her family doesn't have health insurance. So how do I line up? How do I know that you're not sacrificing me when Serena Williams, who understands her body better than anyone, tells you she doesn't feel well and you don't believe her, so she almost dies? I think that there's some much bigger issues. I'm not sure if we can control the disease or contain it. I do think we can give more information about what is happening so that people can have the resources they need. Make more masks available, give out more hand sanitizer, make sure our students have computers and access at home. Why don't we have more uh, Wi-Fi? Why has Verizon turned down the Wi-Fi here in Baltimore City so children can't get online? Like These are some of the issues. 
let the scientists deal with the vaccine. Why don't we try to take care of our community while we're all struggling through the same thing? Because the vaccine here in Baltimore City is the same vaccine in Italy, the same vaccine in South, South Africa, the same vaccine in Kenya. Like it's it's the same vaccine. It's just the way in which different communities are responding. Okay, maybe you should take three more questions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, two more, two more. Okay. Uh, the first one uh, says uh, after watching Just Miss, the movie about Walter McMillian's uh, time on death row for a crime he didn't commit, I learned how bad the prison problem in America really is. How can Joe Biden and other lawmakers prioritize rehabilitation over punishment? I looked at Joe Biden's, uh, his four point plan and uh, talking about the rehabilitation around uh, the mass industrial prison complex wasn't really in the top four. I mean, right now, what, what's the top two that I would like Joe Biden and Kamala Harris to address immediately is the economy and COVID-19. And then number three on the list was talking about race relations, right? So the Black Lives Matter could have a space here at the table, uh, but in terms of trying to think about the mass industrial prison complex, having that fall under some of the issues that are being addressed in the black community under that number three is where I think that work is going to go. I suspect, and this is just my opinion, I suspect that one and two, the economy and COVID-19, not necessarily in that order, will suck up at least the first two years of their uh, administration because it is so out of control that by the time they get to the work around the mass industrial prison complex, we'll be hitting the ground running, hopefully for Kamala Harris's, uh, for her administration. And then we can get those things done. He's gonna dispatch a team, according to what he says on his website, to begin to take up these questions. It's something we're going to have to follow online because I actually believe, and, and I actually am very concerned about those two issues there. What is happening with COVID-19 and how do we get this economy under control? And I know that sounds, probably incredibly selfish. I get that. I'm scared of COVID-19. I want to be able to go visit my parents. I want my, my I want to be able to stand outside and not fear something I can't see. I want people in my community to stop dying from this horrible disease. So focus all your time and effort on getting that because nothing else will work. COVID-19 is ravaging the mass industrial prison complex. How do we deal with COVID-19 in prisons? How about the impact of our schools? How about on our transportation system? How about on our food system? I think every single thing will be impacted until that one thing is dealt with, if it can be dealt with. Because having a vaccine that only survives at sub-zero temperatures and not figuring out how to get it to people, and then not having enough black and brown people trusting a government that has never shown us to be trustworthy to actually take the vaccine. I have friends anecdotally who are like, are they going to have a vaccine for white people and a vaccine for black people? Like it sounds outrageous, except, except Breonna Taylor, right? Except Ahmed Arbery. It sounds outrageous, but except we know the reality of what it means to be black in this country. And we know what it means to sacrifice blackness so that whiteness can survive. The last, <clears throat> the last question. For future elections at all levels, what should be the criteria for selecting people for leadership? That is actually an interesting question. What is the criteria for selecting people for leadership? <laughs> I'm not sure people are listening. I know that when we were having elections here in Baltimore City, I would get on the radio and say, I want to have people in office. I want your heart to be broken for the things that are breaking our hearts. I, I want leaders who love our city and love our country more than they love themselves. I want them to be able to put the needs of the community first. I don't quite know how that works because what I see instead is I see power being held by the same families. I see power being held by a few. I mean, I, I can't say I'm the only one 
who finds it interesting that the next city council president is married to the state's attorney here. I think there's like power concentrated within one family. It's, it's interesting to me in terms of local politics, right? I'm like, what does that mean? I got concerned when Bush too ran. I'm like, you know, you shouldn't pass power like that. No, 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 Hillary, I don't want you passing power like that, that you ran and now next up here comes Chelsea and then we'll do Chelsea and then Michelle and then Sasha's like, no, <laughs> that we need to help to cultivate leadership. So we don't have an oligarchy. I think if people are committed, what we have found over the last four years from AOC to Ilhan to Rashida, right? That if people are committed and they feel called to serve, then they should answer that call and step into that moment and find a way. I don't know what this means. Find a way to continue to be as radical as they are when they run for office as when they get in, because my concern when people get into the House, they get into the Senate, they become mayors, and they get drunk with power, and they forget that people are starving and are suffering. That's why term limits are important. So long answer to a question that I don't know. I want people to have their hearts broken by what's breaking ours. I think that the new administration uh, will, will stay true to that, that that is my hope, that that is my hope, um, because we are suffering. We're suffering in Baltimore City in terms of needing new and fresh leadership. I think our city got set back with what happened with Mayor Catherine Pugh, which was just an example of what happens when just power just absolutely destroys. And also what it means, again, when blackness is sacrificed, because you cannot tell me that Catherine Pugh's $400,000 was the only amount of money being made on a board where people probably made millions but she was the pawn sacrifice so that the queen could survive, right? So it's the notion of how do we hold our politicians accountable and what exactly are we looking to do? I end with, with saying that when I look at the numbers of Baltimore City, people voted in record numbers uh, in this last election uh, against Donald Trump. People were actively engaged, but I think that people were voting to vote against Donald Trump. It just so happens that the person they were voting for was Joe Biden. But the goal was, I need to make a statement against Trump, a repudiation of Trump. And they did. But if you spill that down to the number of people that voted for the mayor, I think uh, Brandon Scott may have gotten 130,000 votes. I mean, that like 600,000 people here in Baltimore City. At least 400,000 are registered. That 130,000. I think that Bob Wallace may have gotten like 40,000. That you know, city council president uh, Mosby got maybe 148. Now, that's a very small amount of people to then be able to seize control. We have to get K-12 more actively involved. We need more civics training in school, and we need people to buy in, not just to I'm voting to get Trump out, I'm voting for the first black president, I'm voting for the first woman president, but I'm voting in the midterm elections too. I'm also voting for my comptroller. Like, I think we have to take a look at the fact that there were key positions in Baltimore City that people ran unchallenged. Bill Henry had nobody challenging him for comptroller. There are districts in Baltimore City where nobody, Zeke Cohen ran unopposed. I'm like, what does that mean? I'm not saying Zeke Cohen's not doing a good job, but to run unopposed in 2020, nobody else had the mantle to serve. Christopher Burnett, who I love, but nobody else? How do you run unopposed in 2020 as a senator, as a council person? So we not just need people to show up and vote, we need people to answer the call to serve. And that's what I think will transform things, learning how to answer the call to serve. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. White. Unfortunately, we are going to end here. <laughs> I, I, I hope it's fine for me to give you an email address for people who want to continue the conversation with you. The email address is kewhitehead at loyola.edu. Actually, Courtney, can you pull up my last slide? Okay, it's posted on the chat. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can pull up the last slide, but I also put it in the chat. Okay, good. You can follow me on Twitter at, at @kwhitehead. I'm sorry, I'm I'm all over social media. It's not hard to find. You can find me every day from three to five on the radio. So give me a call. We we have these conversations every day, um, and we struggle through the important questions together. 
thank you everyone and have a nice evening thank you very much